Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. We are broadcasting live from the Norton Rescue Squad bingo room. So we <laughs> apologize for any bingo noises that you may hear in the background. Um, we are here today to talk about the Solar Services Request for Proposals for Southwest Virginia. This um, presentation is being given by the Solar Work Group of Southwest Virginia, who is um, administering the RFP. Uh, so thank you all for joining us today. Uh, we just finished, almost finished, all of the site tours. We, we're going to tour the Norton facility here after the call, um, but we had really um, some really great visits and all of our participants are super excited to be going solar. Um, so I think that's uh, it for this short introduction. We've got a little agenda here that um, we're going to run through, just some brief introductions as we get started here um, and go over the RFP. And then we'll talk about what we learned on the site tours yesterday and today and review previously submitted questions. And then we'll have some time for questions and answers after that and go over next steps before we adjourn. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Adam, who's going to introduce us. And I forgot to introduce myself. My name is Chelsea Barnes. I'm the new economy program manager at Appalachian Voices and um, facilitating this group purchase program. So. Adam, take it away. Okay. Um, I'm Adam Wells, also with Appalachian Voices, and I'm going to be, I'm the, the tech guy for our webinar uh, today. So I'll be, the way we're going to do questions and introductions is um, I'll call out, well, first we'll do folks in the room, and then I can see who's joining by computer. I'll unmute you, call you out, and let you introduce yourself if you just do name and affiliation. Um, and we'll go through the, the list of folks who are joining by computer that way. And then I'll, I'll do a call out if there's anyone joining by phone, finally. Um, the way we'll do questions, if you have a question at any point throughout the webinar, feel free to use the, um, the question or the chat function in your GoToMeeting control panel uh, to chat over a question. We'll, we'll get those and address any clarifying questions over the course of the, the presentation. And then we'll do, have a long session of question and answer at the end. Uh, if anyone's having trouble with that, uh, you can feel free to send me a uh, email. My email is adam at appvoices.org. It's A D A M at A P P V O I C E S dot org. Um, and we'll make sure that we uh, get you. Uh, and then finally, you should have a raise your hand function as well. Uh, you can try using that. Um, we'll call on you that way at the end. We'll go over again how you, how you do questions once we get to that section. Uh, so with that, we'll go over to Seth. Uh, yeah, my name is Seth Gunning. I work for Creative Solar. We're headquartered out of uh, just north of Atlanta, Georgia. Back to Austin. Hey, everybody. My name is Austin Counts. I'm the AmeriCorps Solar Vista. that has been working with Appalachian Voices, and I helped conduct the tours all across Southwest Virginia these past two days. And I'm uh, Ted Redman with Pale Blue Dot, a consultant supporting Appalachian Voices. All right, we're going to go to folks joining by computer now. Alex Haney, I'm unmuting you. Yeah, my name is Alex Haney with Affordable Energy Concepts in Amherst County near Lynchburg, Virginia. Thanks. Thanks, Alex. All right, Conrad, you're next. Conrad Karsten. Okay, we can't hear you, Conrad, um, but see that you're here. Oh, Conrad? Can you hear me? All set? Yes, please. got you now. Great. Right. Conrad Carson, I'm with RER Energy Group, uh, running out of run out of Reading, Pennsylvania. Okay, thanks, Conrad. Okay, we'll go to Dan Honeycutt next. Dan? Hey, yeah, sorry. Dan Honeycutt, Rockbridge Energy. I'm based out of Florida. Thanks. Hey, Dan, does it send you a uh, unmute request when I click when I unmute you that way? Is that what taking yeah, it the, sure does. The, okay. It does, yeah. So folks, just be on the lookout for an unmute request coming from me. Next up is uh, Dennis Satnick. Hi, Dennis Satnick, uh, RER Energy Group. Thanks, Dennis. Drew Bond is next. OK. 
Okay. Drew, we see where you're joining. If you can hear us, um, if you're not coming through, uh, feel free to shoot me an email if you're having trouble. Uh, we'll go to Hannah Komen next. Hi, it's Hannah Komen. I'm an attorney at the Southern Environmental Law Center. And Hannah, could you say a little bit about your role with the work group? Sure. Um, I am a solar attorney, so I um, work here in Virginia. I'm based in Charlottesville, and I work on solar issues in the Commonwealth. So I have a lot of experience with um, the legislation in Virginia and net metering laws and power purchase agreements. And um, so I'm here to provide information about the legislative landscape in Virginia and um, to provide um, some legal analysis generally. <laughs> Thanks, Hannah. All right, Jim Morrison is next. <laughs> All right, um, Jim, we didn't catch uh, who you're with, I don't think, um, in, in that feedback, but we got that you're here. Uh, John Cannon is next. Hello, I'm John Cannon. Um, I do cryptocurrency mining, and we're looking to expand our data center using the solar infrastructure. Great. Joseph Mumal is next. Hi, uh, Joseph Mumal with Secure Futures out of State in Virginia. Thanks, Joe. Uh, Michael Mornings will be next. Michael Mornings with the Ecological Energy Systems, Bristol, Virginia. Thanks, Michael. Paul Burdick is next. Hi, Paul Burdick with Powerfield Energy out of uh, Falls Church, Virginia. Um, I know Drew is driving and uh, Drew Bond, and uh, but I believe he's on the line as well, also for Powerfield. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, and we see that uh, Drew has actually raised his hand, so I'm going to try um, try Drew again here. Drew? Nope. Oh, okay. We'll go get back in line here. Uh, next is Randy Williams. Randy. Okay, there's some feedback there. I think that's Randy Williams with NCI. Uh, next is Richard Cunningham. Oh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, Richard Cunningham with Home Energy Optimization in Rappahannock County. Design, build, construction, some PV experience. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Richard. Roy Energy is next. Roy? Okay. We'll go to Samantha Brook next. Hi, this is Samantha Brook. I'm with Sun Tribe Solar out of Charlottesville, Virginia. Okay. All right, Thane Hostetler is next. Hello, this is Thane Hostetler with Secure Futures out of Stan. And Tom Brooks Pilling. Hey, Tom Brooks Pilling, Segura Solar, Charlottesville, Virginia. Okay. Uh, saw one hand. All right, is anyone, I think everyone should be on mute now. Anyone on the phone who's muted themselves? Okay, uh, and if you are listening and I haven't called your name, uh, please send me an email at adam at appvoices.org so we can make sure we have a, a record that you joined. 
So with that, I think that's that's the intro. All right. All right. So um, just as some background for the uh, what we're doing today, why we're facilitating this request for proposals. Um, the Solar Work Group of Southwest Virginia was formed um, back in 2016 out of the Southwest Virginia Economic Forum, um, where folks identified solar energy as a great opportunity for the region um, to diversify the economy and grow the economy here in Southwest Virginia. In 2017, a roadmap was created um, to kind of guide the process forward, um, identifying policy solutions and initiatives that should be um, tackled through for the Southwest Virginia region in order to grow the solar industry. The solar work group is convened by um, us here at Appalachian Voices, as well as UVA Wise and People Inc. Um, Mark Mormons is our representative from People Inc. And he's uh, actually has a site in the cohort from the first RFP and the second RFP. Um, and then we also have great assistance from Dialogue and Design, Christine, um, who does our facilitation. So here's just some wonderful pictures of all the work that's been um, done over the years um, since the solar work group was formed. Um, as I mentioned, that roadmap um, has identified four initiatives um, for growing the solar industry in Southwest Virginia. And right now we're working on that number one. We're working on all four, but this specific um, initiative, the Solar Group Purchase Program and the Request for Proposals is working on this first initiative, which is identify and develop sites that are ideal for solar development, especially solar ambassador projects. So the roadmap identified a number of um, amb potential ambassador projects, but we are continuing um, to identify more through the RFP processes that we've been facilitating uh, last year and this year. So if you haven't seen our solar roadmap, um, we encourage you to go look it up online just to get a sense of what the group's been working on and what we'll be working on over the coming years. Um, so just a couple big picture things to think about um, in terms of why we are pursuing solar energy for the region. Um, it's just the declining um, cost of solar energy um, through, across the country, um, which is, turning into more solar development um, across the country. And we also see it as a great employment opportunity for a region that is experiencing the downturn from the um, downturn in the coal economy, um, you know, low um, employment rates and things like that. This, um, the solar industry could be a boon for the region um, in terms of job growth. Um, specifically in Virginia, um, we're also experiencing great solar development across the Commonwealth with 300, more than 370 megawatts of solar installed, more than 250 solar companies, including 111 installers, um, and prices are declining here um, as well, and, our, and solar development is projected to grow by 2,666 megawatts over the next five years. Um, but as you can see, by these lovely maps provided by SIA, all those solar companies and solar jobs are not in the Southwest Virginia region. They're in other parts of the state. So we're really looking to bring all that growth and economic development to this region. Um, and so here's just a nice chart of the uh, solar installers in far Southwest Virginia over the years. So we'd really like first, you know, to get some numbers on that, on that chart and on that map. Um, Oh gosh, they're all going to come up separately. <laughs> so now we're going to launch into just an overview of the RFP. Um, the in terms of pre-proposal requirements, we require that you attend this meeting. Great work, everyone! Give yourself a pat on the back. Um, anyone, as long as somebody from your team is in attendance today, that you are um, eligible to bid on the on the RFP. Um, if there's any issue with that, let you know. Let us know. We have your registration um, from if you registered remotely, and then we see you here in the room if you're here. Um, but let us know if there's any questions about um, whether or not you are logged as a participant. Um, we ask that you submit a notice of intent to submit an our a, a bid by April 19th, by the end of the day, just so we know who we can send um, additional information as we're still gathering more information about the sites and answering questions. Um, we, you know, we need your information to send, to know to send you um, the addenda. Um, this is not required to submit a proposal if you don't get us that notice of intent by the 19th. 
um, you can still submit a bid, but we may not be able to get you the um, any updates about the RFP. Um, last thing I want to mention is please do not communicate directly with any of the site owners. You, If you were on the site tours, you might have received a card from the folks, the kind folks that were giving us tours. Um, but we really want to make sure that the people who are communicating with um, the site owners are, are, are me and the other um, folks here facilitating the process just so they're not getting peppered with um, tons of questions from the different installers. If you have a question about a specific site, send that to me directly and I will do my very, very best to get that question answered. Um, oops, if you have questions, those must be submitted by April 26th by 5 p.m. Um, and again, I'm the sole point for those questions um, and we that way we can get that out in the um, answers and addenda that will come out by May 3rd. We ask that you keep your proposal to 25 pages. Um, we have this year, if you were participating in the program last year, this year we're providing a template for you to use just to try to standardize the answers. So we ask that you use that. The 25 page limit does not include the cover page, a cover letter, and the um, exhibits and appendices that you add to the end of, the, of your bid. Um, and so make sure that your, uh, your bid is organized as directed in the RFP on page 12, um, make sure your pages are in that order. And we are only accepting electronic submissions. And guess what? Those also go to me. Um, so this is all outlined in the RFP um, itself, but just to give you a quick reminder that the, um, in terms of the proposal content, we're looking for a cover letter. Um, a profile of your company or your team, if there are multiple companies included in your bid. We're asking for a minimum of three references, and those should be um, customers that you have installed, where you have installed projects. Um, give us an overview of the qualifications of your team, including resumes, resumes of key members, your experience, especially if you have any experience in Virginia or in the Southwest Virginia region. Um, and the different financing options that you provide your customers, we'd like to know um, about those options and how, you know, your general experience with those contract types, you know, how many customers approximately have you provided those financing options to. Um, next up, we have the, your company business practices, including some basic health and safety records, um, a, a brief amount of information about how you process change orders. We don't need a, um, a lot of information about that. We just want to make sure you've got a, a process in place and that um, it works for your customers. And we'd like a sample contract as well. Ted, do you want to say anything more about that? Uh, no, other than the, the sample contract, be sure to look at the, um, the attachment exhibit I believe it's Exhibit B, General Conditions of the Contract, which uh, is was put together as a way of uh, uh, helping the conversation between the successful respondent and the sites. Uh, it's a starting place for general conditions, and so your contract should incorporate those those points. All right. Next up, um, the propo your proposal should include information about the work quality, including typical equipment warranties um, and any procedures that you have for incidents, as well as your customer service, um, uh, just an overview about your customer service, any, including any complaints, um, and describe any training that you're providing to the site owners. You know, a lot of people in this region and in our cohort are new to solar, so we want to make sure that um, your company know, uh, can, will be helping them to understand how to maintain the facility, those kinds of things. I um, want to make sure we keep good relationships and that all of the customers have great experiences with solar so that they can be ambassadors for solar in the region. For your cost proposal, we ask that you use the Exhibit C provided in the RFP. Um, use one for each site, and we're asking you to propose a cost the um, a cash purchase option and a financing option for each site. So that could be um, depending on the site and depending on you know what kind of financing options your company provides. That could be a PPA, it could be a loan, it could be a um, self generation agreement or solar service agreement. Um, whatever that option is that works best for that 
specific site and for your company. We also recommend that you provide a pre preliminary array layout for each site, but um, recognizing that that might change going forward um, as you learn more about the site. Um, Ted, do you want to add anything on that? So okay. What was provided is just a reference. Um, you can add any additional information um, about the that you think is necessary for your bid, um, but if but make sure that you know you're putting those in the optional appendices, and that if and we just want to note that if any of the information conflicts, we're going to um, go with what is in Exhibit C, the um, the cost proposal. <coughs> Last thing that we want to really talk about with the um, with your bids itself is that because this is supposed this is an economic development opportunity for our region we're really hoping that you can include a local workforce development opportunity for the region or use local interns so um, we ask that you propose uh, how you will do this um, if you are the selected bidder what kind of local workforce training opportunities you'll provide or what internship opportunities you'll provide and we are happy to um, connect you with folks if you need connections for um, example at the community college or anything like that um, and we'll try to get some contact information out in the agenda as well um, for possible contacts that you can use for those programs the bids are due may 21st at 5 p.m eastern please email them to me. There's my email address. Um, we're gonna be reviewing those submissions um, over the next, um, I think, week after they come in, and we'll let you know probably by May 28th or 29th um, whether we'd like you to come in for an in-person interview on June 4th, um, depending on the kinds of responses we get and the preferences of the selection committee. The selection committee is, um, not the facilitators of the work group, but the actual participants. Um, the building owners will be the ones selecting the the bids. We will be facilitating the process and um, distilling some of the information for them, but um, it's the building owners that will be making that final choice. And so we hope to be able to um, issue a notice of award by June 5th. Um, we're asking folks to really make an effort to um, get the contracts signed and moving forward um, quickly, um, recognizing that the federal tax credit declines after um, the end of the year. So we're pressing our participants, the building owners, to let you know that, um, by July 5th whether or not they will um, proceed with an installation based on the bid that you submitted for their specific project. Um, and then we're asking you to work to get a contract signed by early September. Um, we recognize that there are going to be things that might get in the way of this. You know, if you're not getting the information that you need from the um, from the site owner, you know, that deadline is not hard. But we really are hoping to move these projects forward um, as quickly as possible. Um, and we also ask that you remain in con constant communication with the building owners. You know. We, um, we want this to be a positive experience for people participating in the program. So um, after that, after you, if you are awarded the bid, you know we're asking that you really take over the kind of client management and customer management and relationships. So now I'm going to pass it over to Hannah. Um, she's going to talk about financing options and other legal issues in the state. Thanks, Chelsea. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay. going to take that as a yes. Oh, well, yes, sorry. I muted Adam. He didn't know it. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so, again, this is Hannah Komen. I'm at the Southern Environmental Law Center, and I'm in our Charlottesville office. I'm the solar attorney here in Virginia. Uh, I've been at SELC for almost two years. Um, prior to SELC, I spent five years at a private law firm in Boston, Massachusetts working with entrepreneurs and startups in the clean tech sector, as well as solar developers. So that is my background. And I've seen a lot of PPAs, and I've seen a lot of um, financing agreements. And now I am down here in Virginia trying to help um, solar take hold. Um, my role here is to provide information. I am 
not acting as anyone's legal counsel. Um, so I'm happy to answer any questions you may have, provide information and point you in the right direction. Um, but I'm, again, I'm not legal counsel to the solar sites, to the solar, the Southwest Solar Work Group, or any solar developers. Um, I'm going to go through a lot of information about net metering, PPAs, and the federal tax credit. Um, many of you already know all of this because you have already been doing projects in Virginia. Um, but um, bear with us <laughs> because this is inf really important information for anyone that is new to Virginia. Um, I will also send out my notes or I'll send them to Chelsea and Chelsea can distribute them. So no need to, to take notes. Um, so anyway, here we go. So net metering is available in Virginia. Um, it's inv available to jurisdictional customers of investor owned utilities and electric cooperatives. And it's available to all classes of customers. One thing to note is that um, non-jurisdictional customers, which are the schools that are part of these products, RFPs uh, negotiate their contracts separately with the utilities. So everything I say is slightly different for the schools, though they are eligible for net metering. Um, so net metering in IOUs, that's Dominion. Down in Southwest Virginia, we're not in Dominion territory. So we deal with APCO and ODP. ODP is um, owned by Kentucky, Kentucky Utility, um, and ODP stands for Old Dominion Power. Net metering in the IOU territory is uh, one for one compensation. So that means that um, the, the eligible cost generators are producing energy and getting compensated at the retail rate. The electrical generating facility must have a capacity of not more than 20 kilowatts for residential customers and not more than one megawatt for non-residential customers. And that one megawatt is, um, we're saying one megawatt in AC. Uh, the electrical generating facility must be located on the customer's premises and connected to the customer's wiring on the customer's side of its interconnection with the distributor. So the law and the regulations are silent on whether you can net meter across a road. I know that's been a question for some people. Um, another, th another thing I wanna flag is that meter aggregation is not allowed um, unless you're doing agricultural net metering, which is not part of this RFP. The capacity of any generating facility installed shall not exceed the expected annual energy consumption based on the previous 12 months of billing history or an annualized calculation of billing history in, if 12 months of billing history is not available. So I've heard that from Dominion that in practice they'll take into an account a load letter provided by an electrician explaining why the previous 12 months of billing history doesn't accurately reflect the future expected annual energy consumption. I'm, I think it would be worth seeing um, if that's a problem, whether ODP or APCO would accept such a letter um, as well if we don't get the 12 months of billing history or if that doesn't reflect what um, the customers or the site wants to do. Net metering is available in each utility territory until such territory reaches 1% of its adjusted Virginia peak load forecast for the previous year. And we, we refer to that as the 1% cap. Um, that we've heard is not going to be a problem in ODP's territory. ODP really doesn't have any solar. Um, and I've heard that we're getting, well, actually I don't know whether we're close to the cap for APCO or not. Um, that would be something to talk to the utility about. Um, so how it works is that any excess generation in one month rolls over to the next month and the customer's credit on the next bill at that retail rate. If there is excess generation on an annual basis, then the customer generator shall receive payment at an avoided cost rate from the utility or be credited at a, an avoided cost rate from the utility. Uh, the eligible customer generator owns any renewable energy certificates associated with the electrical generating facility. Um, I will, so that's kind of a brief overview of net metering for the IOUs. I will send you a link to the appropriate legislation and regulations for each of those utilities. And net metering for electric co-ops. So um, there's been new legislation passed in Virginia regarding net metering for electric cooperatives. The legislation becomes effective July 1st, 
2019. And in this RFP, we are dealing with one um, electric cooperative, and that is um, PVEC, Powell Valley Electric Cooperative. So um, this would only impact that one. Um, the legislation allows the cooperatives to move away from the one-to-one -one compensation for net metering eventually. It's, it's on a glide path where demand charges are going to be added um, in the future. But there's going to be a transition period that shall begin upon the first to occur of the date the cooperative reaches the 1% net metering cap for its territory or five years following the date the cooperative provides notice to the commission stating they wish to transition. So any net metering customers who are not who are interconnected prior to the transition start date will be grandfathered in at their current rate until July 1st, 2039. So you can see that there's a long period of grandfathering and there's going to be at least a five year glide path um, to transition. Um, for now, net metering is the same in co-op territory as in the IOU territory, except for the following. Net metering is open to co-op territory to all customers on a first-come, first-served basis until the following caps are reached. And these caps are expressed in the AC nameplate. Um, it's 2% of system peak for residential customers, 2% of system peak for nonprofits and non-jurisdictional customers, like schools, 1% of system peak for other non-residential customers, um, and in addition, the co-op board may decide to raise these caps um, from these, this amount at their discretion, but they cannot lower it. Um, another thing I wanted to flag was that after August 1st, 2019, but before January 1st, 2020, the State Corporation Commission shall initiate a rulemaking proceeding to create regulations to allow third-party partial requirement power purchase agreements. So after the conclusion of the rulemaking proceeding, third party power um, partial requirements power purchase agreements, the purpose of which is to finance the purchase of renewable generation facilities through the sale of electricity shall be permitted only for those retail customers and non-jurisdictional customers of the co-ops that are exempt from federal income taxation. In other words, there's going to be certain requirements um, that the commission is going to develop in regs, but um, for, but electric co-ops will may permit nonprofits to um, use PPA. So we have to see what those regs are going to look like. And um, my understanding is that the law just says that the co-ops are permitted to allow PPAs, not that they must allow PPAs, but this is a new law. So um, we, we're still kind of seeing where it's going to um, come out. Um, finance. So now onto financing options, meaning PPAs, SGAs, loans. So I just talked about PPAs and co-op territory. Um, in addition, there's a PPA pilot program in Dominion and APCO territories. Um, the Aggregated capacity of all generation facilities that are subject to PPAs at any time shall not exceed 50 megawatts in Dominion territory, but only seven megawatts in AFCO territory. And this amount is also counted to the 1% um, cap under net metering. And all PPAs under the pilot are subject to the net metering regulations I just went over. So um, the PPA law is a bit unclear. The term power purchase agreements is not defined in the Virginia Code. APCO takes the position that their PPA pilot only applies to nonprofit private institutions of higher education. And ODP takes the position that PPAs are not allowed in their territory. So um, that, that, in essence, means that the PPA pilot or the utilities take the position that the PPA pilot cannot be used for these um, sites under this RFP. Um, however, solar leases are allowed. Solar self-generation agreements, which are similar to PPAs, but instead of selling electricity, they're selling so solar as a service, are, are potential avenues. Um, 
APCO previously allowed a project that was financed through a self-generation agreement. It's unclear whether they will allow additional projects in the future. ODP has not taken a position on whether customers may use self-generation agreements, so that's an open question. Loans are often available for these um, solar installations from maybe even local banks. I think we have a few contacts at local banks, so maybe that would be something that we could pursue. Um, mainly, solar is new in Southwest Virginia. This is what we're trying to work with. This is what we're trying to encourage. So we would really look to you as the solar developers to be creative and propose something that we can make work under the current legislative landscape. Um, finally, I want, just wanna to touch on the federal tax credit. As you probably know, the federal investment tax credit will step down at the end of this year. It's currently a 30% tax credit and it'll step down to 26% for projects that begin construction in 2020. So in order to obtain the 30% tax credit for these programs, it's imperative that the solar developer who was chosen for this RFP establish that they have begun construction on these projects before the end of the year. The IRS considers the beginning of construction to be either um, that the solar developer can show that they have begun physical work of a significant nature, which is a term of art, or that the tax show that the taxpayer has paid or incurred 5% or more of the total cost of the energy project. I'm sure most of you are very, very familiar with um, the federal tax credit, but we just want to encourage you to review the IRS regulations and make sure that your proposal is in compliance and that these projects will receive the full 30% tax credit. Um, so that's all I have to say. I know that's a lot of information, so I will be sending Chelsea a summary of what I just said with links to the appropriate legislation and regulations for you and your attorneys to review. Um, feel free to ask me if you have any questions, if you need any additional information. I'm here as an kind of advisor and um, to provide whatever you guys need. So thank you. Thanks, Hannah. We had one question come in, um, if you're able to stay unmuted for a moment, um, that we'd like you to answer now, which is yeah. just, can you explain the implications of the 1% net metering cap? Um, that the implications are, so for ODP, I don't expect there to be any implications because um, according to ODP, since they don't have any solar, they um, shouldn't reach their cap yet. Um, but if they, if there is a lot of solar in ODP's territory, then there will be a limit on how much more solar can be developed up to that 1% of the peak demand in that territory. Um, I believe for APCO, we are also not close to that 1% cap but I think they are close to um, their cap for their PPA pilot. That's my understanding, um, but I'm, I can't say for sure because um, the utilities tend to guard these, these secrets. Um, but the, the implication is just that we can't have more net metered solar beyond 1% of that peak demand in Thanks. that territory. Thanks, Hannah. One more question, if you're willing. Um, <laughs> we had, of course. Uh, wondering about um, whether you know anything about net metering across parcels where, you, um, for example, we have a multifamily home where there are multiple, um, multiple parcels for tax purposes. The same entity owns the tax, the parcels next to each other, um, but wondering about net metering across those different parcels. Um, just so I'm clear, the both there's two parcels or they have the same owner, but it the solar would be generated on one parcel and then um, it would be used on the other parcel. Is that right? Correct. I believe it's if it's the same owner. Um, oh wait, another question: Are the are the two parcels side by side or what's between the two parcels? 
Yes, they're side by side. There are multiple parcels, I think, though, right? Like it's multiple continu contiguous parcels. So it might be that one, you know, it's located on the furthest left um, parcel. And then do you want to explain this? I feel like yeah, Ted's going to answer the question. <laughs> well, Mike uh, and Hannah, just to uh, clue you in, uh, the particular property is the Sweet Briar, which is the People Inc. So they're yeah. uh, renting out multiple townhomes. Uh, they own all of these parcels under the one entity, but uh, we believe that they are multiple parcels, again, all under one ownership. And then they're renting out the units. Uh, all of the units are rented out by them. Um, what's the, how do they do their metering? Are each of the unit do each of the units have separate meters? Yeah. Yeah. Right now they're separately metered. Um, I think the they're going to pursue um, putting everything on one meter, um, but that's kind of an open question. If this is too complicated to get into right now, we can um, try to look into it some more and and provide yeah. an answer in the, um, in the addendum. But um, I'm I think that I mean the only the only language about it is that um, it has to, that the generating facility must be located on the customer's premises and connected to the customer's wiring on the customer's side of its interconnection with the distributor. So it all comes down to what is the definition of customer's premises. Um, I would argue that that is part of if it's owned by the customer you're not going over anybody else's land um that it would all be part of the customer's premises but if maybe you could send me kind of a, a map or something like that and we can dig into it a little bit more okay yeah we'll we'll follow up on that all right i think that's um all we're gonna do right now on financing and legal issues but um Hannah, if you stay on the line, we might have more questions for you at the end. Um, and thank you so much for that great overview and all of your expertise. We really appreciate it. Next, I'm going to hand it over to Ted to talk about the um, the specific sites and um, and what we saw the last two days. Thank you. Okay, so oops, that doesn't work. How do you? Uh, oh yeah. There need the go. magic instruction. There we go. Okay, here we are. So uh, just sort of a recap or an explanation. Uh, you should have all seen the Exhibit A documents uh, off of the website um, for all the uh, uh, RFP documents. Uh, under Exhibit A, um, we are uploading all the content that we have available, uh, and um, we'll be uploading more as we get it related to existing conditions, uh, roof warranties, anything like that that we have. Um, the exhibits uh, also include uh, conceptual array configurations. Please take those with a grain of salt. Those are not intended to be instructional. This is, uh, those are not construction documents. They're just intended to illustrate uh, potential and were used to begin the dialogue with the uh, site owners. We are um, very much encouraging each uh, respondent to propose what they believe to be the most appropriate solution for each site. Um, in general, our goals for the exhibit A's that we've put out there were really just trying to maximize solar on that site, um, trying to achieve net zero wherever possible. Um, that may or may not be what you believe to be the best solution given the uh, utility billings and the tariffs that any given site are under. So please uh, understand we're, we're looking to your expertise. Each team should do propose what they believe is best. Um, oops, I have to get back to the area. Um, so whatever optimal, uh, whatever you believe is optimal, feel free to propose. Um, a little bit of site-specific information. We'll probably kind of go through these a little bit quicker um, if I can get them going. I'm just going to get all the bullet points. <laughs> Sorry. That's really the, uh, for APCA, um, it's a nonprofit entity. They're under Powell Valley Electric Co-op. 
Uh, the preliminary concept shows a uh, 14.7 kilowatt ground monorail. Uh, that size uh, appears to uh, probably provide them uh, net zero energy. Um, the on sort of visual inspection of the building, uh, I think our impression is that perhaps the building can't handle a rooftop uh, mounted array. It's a prefabricated uh, metal structure. Uh, feel free to propose that if you believe it can, though. Um, the portion of the site that we're showing the array is on the northern uh, edge of their site. Uh, on the site walkthrough, we did discover that they actually own more land towards the east. There's, you'll see a, a clump of trees, <laughs> pretty, pretty sizable little clump of trees uh, to the east, uh, and they own that all the way down uh, the hill. Uh, I think there's a fence line down. Uh, at the bottom of the hill that you can probably see on the aerial. Um, they are open to removal of trees if necessary for an appropriate uh, array configuration. Uh, so feel free to propose that if you think that uh, best. In that northern section where we're showing the array, there is some uh, underground drainage, probably a storm sewer line coming off of the road is my guess. Uh, we are not 100% certain the limits of that. Uh, that structure though. On it. You can see if you look, I think if you get a really high quality aerial, you, there are a couple manhole covers. Uh, my suspicion is that we're talking about a line that's just connecting the manhole covers and continuing along the roadway, but we don't know for certain right now. Um, valid uh, health uh, plex. I don't know how many more buttons I got, but I think that's good. <laughs> so <laughs> Ballot Health Plex. Uh, also, it's a nonprofit entity. They're in the ODP utility uh, uh, region. Uh, we're at that. Uh, the con concept shows a rooftop unit, a uh, rooftop array of about uh, 301 kilowatts. Um, they are open to carports. Um, you'll note on their uh, on the site plan, there's an awful lot of parking around the building, particularly to the east. There's a parking uh, lot between the subject building and uh, the next building to the east, and there's a lot of parking to the south. They are open to carport if it can provide it as, be provided as an, an amenity. Uh, the roof itself is uh, relatively new, um, well, about halfway through its warranty lifespan, I should say. So it's about 10 years old, uh, 11 years left on the warranty. Okay, First Baptist Church. Uh, it's an Appalachian uh, power uh, utility. Uh, we're currently showing two ground mount arrays that uh, in further discussion, actually today, uh, the pastor was recommending that he'd actually prefer to just migrate uh, all the ground mount on the northern site. So the small site to the west uh, that is next to a house, uh, he won't use, he's, he's thinking they would not use that site. Again, if you have a compelling reason to propose whatever, you should go ahead and propose that. But at uh, the walkthrough, uh, he was migrating his opinion towards a uh, ground mount array to the north. Uh, the roof uh, is available for an array, so feel free to uh, recommend a rooftop array um, if, if you believe that to be the best solution based on their electric usage or a combination of rooftop and ground mount. The, uh, both ground mount locations would need to cross the street. Um, and as Hannah indicated, we're, we're trying to understand uh, more fully the sort of uh, ramifications of that. Um, the northern uh, property, there are actually some empty conduits. There appear to be empty, empty conduits running underneath the, uh, the small street there between the subject property and the, build, and the building itself. Uh, Ironworks Cycling and Ironworks uh, Fitness Center. Um, so the cycling, uh, the roof is definitely in need of replacement. The owner is aware of that and the building owner will happily orchestrate re uh, replacing their roof uh, membrane prior to or in coordination with the installation. Um, but just be aware that if you've looked at the roof, you'll know that it, it looks a little, it, it's in need. Uh, but they are planning on replacing it. Um, the Ironworks Fitness Center, uh, that building we're looking at roughly a 32 kilowatt rooftop array. Uh, both buildings, I should say, are an ODP utility uh, uh, range. 
Um, the Ironworks Fitness Center, when we were there in person, um, the owner was explaining to us that uh, some time ago, the building did have some differential settlement uh, at about the third point of the building from the west end over. There uh, was some differential settlement and they are uh, mitigating that right now uh, over sort of a long haul, slowly ratcheting the building back up. Uh, we don't have a reason to believe that it's structurally unsound. Just wanting to, to let you know that the building has a little bit of movement that is going to be happening uh, over the coming months as he continues to ratchet it back up. Uh, Norton <clears throat> Rescue Squad, uh, we're looking at a rooftop system uh, on this building, uh, roughly 72 kilowatts. Uh, they are interested in uh, battery storage. Uh, as a rescue squad building, uh, you know, fire station rescue, you can uh, understand they have emergency uh, operations. They do use the space that we're in right now for uh, supporting emergency functions uh, in the community. Um, we do not have a recommended battery uh, storage size uh, right now. The cost proposal does ask for a uh, cost per kilowatt. Uh, if we can get a better handle on what their desired uh, total kilowatt uh, battery storage system is, we'll let you know. But in the meantime, anticipate a cost per kilowatt. Uh, and they are pursuing a grant uh, to support, um, I believe, the battery storage system. Just so you know. That the grant application issue should not affect your submission, just to let you know kind of what's going on. Uh, Pennington Gap uh, Lee Theater and Community Center. Uh, the building is owned and operated by the city. They operate two functions, the theater and the community center. Um, the one building with two functions in it has three meters. <laughs> so one, two, three. Um, we are looking at a rooftop system, uh, approximately 100 uh, kilowatts. Um, the theater building itself was built in 1947. It's got a sloped roof, but it's a uh, low sloped roof. Um, we are not 100% certain on the, uh, the degree of slope, but I would guess it's looking more like a, a you know, one in 12, two in 12 kind of a slope um, where the ridge runs right down the center of the higher portion of that building there. Uh, the, it's a metal roof, uh, mechanically fastened metal roof installed in 2000. The community center has a newer roof installed in 2013, also a, a mechanically fastened metal roof. The Pennington Gap uh, sewer plant uh, we're looking at a ground mount array. The current concept shows 220 kilowatt ground mount array. Uh, the concept shows currently using the site just to the south of the, uh, the sewage treatment facility. There's a fence line that you'll note where uh, the array is sitting on top of. That fence line is movable. They do own the property all the way to the river. Um, be aware though that south of the fence line there is flooding that occurs uh, intermittently uh, so either uh, site reconfiguration of bringing in uh, soil or raising up the array um, alternatively we discovered yesterday on the tour that they do own additional land to the north um, you'll note that uh, there's a small building uh, for those of us that were on the tour that is just located just north of the treatment uh, functions and that has uh, a small forested area to the north and to the east. And uh, we're verifying on the exact extent of what they own, but we believe they own that entire sort of triangular shaped area. And the city is open to tree removal uh, if your proposal requires it. And that includes, by the way, the, if you want to use the southern portion of the site, the trees along the river can be removed. Um, or if you want to locate on the northern edge of the site, um, trees there could also be removed. The city is happy to function um, to help uh, remove the trees. Um, so I think your bid for right now can propose, can assume that the city will remove the trees at your, uh, at your direction and coordination. Um, I will uh, point out that if you 
move towards the southern edge of the site and you do remove trees along the river, we would like for you to, to uh, anticipate in your bid putting in uh, riparian uh, plantings. Um, we'll see if we can get some information on um, appropriate uh, regional sort of native grasses and so forth, but we want to make sure that we're not going to create a, a watershed problem in the, the river. Uh, the uh, Pennington Gap Town Hall, um, that site has, uh, you'll see um, multiple buildings. There's three buildings in a row. The subject building is the uh, largest building uh, on the south uh, of those three uh, metal buildings. Um, the concept shown on the Exhibit A was a ground-mounted concept. Um, we were uncertain if the existing building could handle a rooftop. On the tour yesterday, um, we don't have structural calculations uh, done. However, I think the uh, prevailing opinion was that the building probably could handle a rooftop array. Um, so feel free to um, explore that, a rooftop array, or if you want to uh, go with a ground mount array, that is open as well. Uh, ground mount array locations available are both where we're currently showing the ground mount which is just to the north east of the subject building there are also uh, spaces available uh, across the little road there near their parking uh, that you could use for ground mount array as well so this site is highly flexible in terms of what you may want to uh, suggest um, the uh, Pennington, Gap, uh, Pennington Gap water plant, uh, that is looking at a ground mount array. Uh, they are in the o ODP utility uh, uh, region as well. Uh, the current um, concept illustrates a 1.2 uh, megawatt uh, installation uh, looking to try to achieve full net zero. Uh, however, on the tour yesterday, um, it appears that this um, the uh, Existing uh, electrical systems may uh, be able to handle just uh, a 600 kilowatt. Um, there's also some uh, underground drainage, which we I think are going to be getting some some information from the city as to where uh, underground uh, piping and infra infrastructure may exist. Uh, as soon as we have that available, we'll we'll upload it. Um, the intent there, though, is to maximize uh, capacity. So if we can achieve a 1.2 megawatt or uh, thereabouts in order to achieve net zero, that would again be the goal, but uh, you do need to propose as you believe most appropriate. And again, for this site, uh, tree removal is uh, uh, an open opportunity and the city will coordinate removal uh, at the direction of the selected respondent. Uh, Sweetbriar is a multifamily low-income uh, site. It has multiple meters. Each uh, current unit currently has a meter. Um, they are all renters under one single ownership. Uh, People Inc., the owner, will be exploring um, uh, aggregating the meters. That is their intent. Um, as we were talking about earlier, each building is on its own parcel. However, all parcels are adjacent to each other and all parcels are under the single ownership. The concept array illustrates 170 kilowatt ground mount. Um, the owner is open to an array of any configuration anywhere on the site if uh, someone believes another location is better. You'll notice that uh, the sort of wishbone shaped uh, streets have uh, buildings lining uh, the streets in many locations, but there's a portion particularly to the west uh, where there are, the buildings stop, but the road continues. They do have plans of building 10 more uh, buildings similar to what they have. Those future buildings will always ring the existing roads. So as you consider where you might propose an array, just keep that in mind. Uh, the owner is willing to reconsider where they place buildings if, if there's a compelling reason why you may want to put an array right up against the road, for instance. But um, just keep in mind what their current plans are, which is to build new buildings along the roads. Um, they are also open to rooftop 
uh, mounted arrays on the various residential structures if you want to explore that as well. And then finally, the Western Front Hotel. <clears throat> uh, uh, we're looking currently at a combined uh, rooftop and carport capacity of about 112 kilowatts. The site owner is um, illustrated, I think, significant interest in a carport solution. They understand that their total usage compared to their rooftop is uh, pretty diverse <laughs> and they're open to other solutions. So um, whether you want to you know, lift an array up on, uh, on uh, over the, uh, the open plaza spaces or uh, ground mount, uh, excuse me, not a ground mount array, a carport array that covers just parking area uh, stalls, or if you want to propose a ground mount, or excuse me, a rooftop array that covers the entire parking area, including the uh, drive lanes, they're open to any solutions like that. Um, the existing concept illustrates roughly uh, 18 or so kilowatts on the roof and the balance in carport. Uh, they're a newer business. Uh, they've uh, been open for about 14 months. Uh, I believe in our um, utility information that's uploaded right now, we have, I think, only eight months worth of energy usage, and we're working on getting additional months of energy usage for you. All right. I'm going to take back over here. This is Chelsea again. Um, we have received some questions, obviously, along the site tour and um, by email, and most of those were very site-specific questions that we have answered in this overview here. Um, but again, if you have questions, please keep chatting them in to Adam, and then we're going to do some more questions at the end here, and also email. feel free to email me questions after um, our call today. The one question that was not specific to a site um, that I did want to address here just overall um, Somebody asked if all of the sites require financing, and the um, brief answer to that is yes. Um, we're, in the RFP, we're asking you to propose a cash option and a financing option of whatever, whether that's a third-party PPA where it's allowed, whether it's a lease, whether it's an SGA, whatever um, you know your company works with, and whatever happens to be legal in that utility territory. Um, but you know we're asking you to propose both um, and whatever is w within the scope of whatever's legal and whatever it is that your company offers or is able to develop for this purpose. Um, a couple other things I just wanted to note um, about the specific project sites. Um, we've got you know one very small project in there. You'll notice the Ironworks Cycling Facility. The reason why we've included that in this um, in this RFP that you know was supposed to be geared toward um, larger projects is really that um, Bobby and Lorenzo, who are the owners of the Ironworks Cycling Shop, and then Bobby also owns the gym, um, is that Lorenzo is a very early adopter of solar in our region. He has solar on his home, and it's also a very important community site um, for the region. Uh, the cycle shop there is um, doing a lot of work to bring in out the outdoor recreation economy to our region. Um, so we really um, feel like that's a really great ambassador site, and they'll be um, really good ambassadors for solar. Um, and Bobby is on the Big Stone Gap Town Council, so we're really hoping that if we get you know solar on those two businesses, is that they'll be really great um, ambassadors for future solar in, in that town and in the region. And then the last thing I wanted to note is on the Norton Rescue Squad, if you are interested in proposing a battery storage option that is not a deal breaker, um, if you do not, they are interested in it, but they also understand that it's going to affect the economics of the project. Um, but I do have a lot of, I have a lot of information about the um, appliances and electrical use. We went, I went through the facility and documented which um, appliances and lights and things like that would need to be on and powered by a battery system in the event of an outage. So I can share that information with you um, and we'll probably include it in the addendum um, for everyone. Um, but if you would like it sooner than that, I can. I, I just need to get it into a better form. It wasn't quite ready when we had the, when we issued the RFP. So, but we'll get that into a more digestible format and share it with y'all. So we're going to open it up to other questions. Um, if you, Adam, do you want to call on people or you just want to take them in by chat? 
Yeah, sure. Well, um, so folks, some folks have been using the chat function. Uh, if you're comfortable using that, feel free to continue chatting questions in. Uh, you can also uh, click the raise your hand button. It should be a button that looks like a hand. You just click that, then we'll see that you're raising your hand and we can unmute you and call on you. Uh, you can also email a question to adam at appvoices.org. I've got my email open. Um, and then if there's any questions that don't get addressed, uh, feel free to email them to Chelsea. Um, so just going to check here, see if anyone's raised their hand. Don't see any hands raised. Perhaps we were so thorough. <laughs> Maybe you can go over next steps. Um, we'll come back to questions. Okay. Already. I'm going to go on to just next steps for the process here. Um, but please feel free to raise your hand or send in any additional questions um, to uh, Adam. Um, as we mentioned earlier, the notice of intent to submit proposals is due by April 19th at 5 p.m. Eastern. Um, and if you have any additional questions, um, please get them in by April 26th at 5 p.m. Eastern. We will send a uh, answers um, out by May 3rd. It might be May 2nd if we're all out on the river on May 3rd, um, but May 2nd or May 3rd. Um, and your bids are due by May 21st at 5 p.m. Eastern. And those, again, are emailed directly to me at chelsea at appvoices.org. And if you don't have my email address, um, I don't know how you got on this webinar, but uh, you <laughs> hopefully you can find it on our website if you don't have it. Um, we will be conducting interviews um, of the shortlisted bidders on June 4th. That's um, going to be in Norton at the Community Center. And then we will issue, hopefully, a notice of intent to award um, on June 5th with the selected bidder. Um, we anticipate being able to announce that day, but um, you know, of course, if there are any unexpected thing, issues that come up or quite additional questions that come up, um, it may be after that date. Assuming a June 5th announcement date, um, all the participants will be asked to um, send you a notice of intent to engage by July 5th. Um, and then we'd ask that those contracts be signed, or yeah, a contract be presented, I'm sorry, to the participants by September 3rd, um, understanding that there might be some delays due to um, participant lagging or other unknown events. Um, and then the system operation date is negotiated individually by subject site, but we, you know, again, are really trying to hit that um, 2019 tax credit level for all of our participants. Questions? Yeah, we've got a couple. Uh, I think these are good for Ted to answer. Uh, so the first one is if we find that sites are not suitable for solar, are we able to only communicate a subset of the sites in our proposal? Uh, so I, I'm not entirely sure what they mean by communicate a subset, but basically the, the, the answer here. is you if you if there is a site that is not attractive to you for bidding on it or a site that you for some reason think is inappropriate for solar um, then feel free to not submit a bid for that site please uh, apprise yourself of how the cost proposals are being uh, translated into points though uh, become familiar with uh, in the RFP we talk about the the points by category and then we talk about how uh, costs are being translated into points. And so um, uh, just be aware of that. But we we certainly are not trying to get people to bid on something they think is something they're not interested in bidding on. Uh, we are trying to encourage creative solutions for all the sites that have been put forth, though. All right, Ted, this is definitely a Ted question next. Uh, are there any requirements of sourcing materials or type of materials such as US made? And is high watt panel like the 490 watt 98 cell module in the preliminary designs required? Is a 72 no. cell, okay, so no. No. <laughs> is a 72 cell module or 60 cell module acceptable? Yes, so uh, I should expand out a little bit. Uh, those, the preliminary uh, concepts that are shown again are uh, illustrative only. Do not think of them as construction documents. You are free to select whatever um, panels or inverters or racking systems, 
cables, whatever you believe is uh, an appropriate uh, component, you can include in your bid. Uh, we do have a, re uh, uh, a relatively loose requirement that just simply says, though, that the uh, components are supposed to show up on, I'm, and I'm, my mind just went blank on the name, the California uh, Registry, uh, which basically, I, I don't know of a manufacturer that's not on that list um, that just illustrates a level of quality. But as long as your um, components are on that list, uh, you can propose whatever you want. Uh, you can propose whatever panel size you want. So uh, have at it. <laughs> is module level lo, module level monitoring required on all sites? Uh, that's that's a good question. I'm thinking it through. Um, that's a great question. Let, let's. Uh, I'll put, it, I, I'll put it to you this way. Uh, so we're asking for two options. Uh, one option is a cash option. One option is a third party option. And I think uh, for, the, for the most part, most of the sites, many of the sites I should say, I can't say most, but I do know that many of the sites are probably going to be very interested in the third party option. You know, we're dealing with nonprofit, government entities, those sorts of things and so with that understanding uh, I would suggest you would definitely want to design the system where it meets your expectations uh, uh, for your third party structure and uh, the folks that I know that do third party they like to monitor at the level of a panel so they know when there's an issue going on but um, uh, I think we would probably be uh, fine with monitoring at the uh, inverter level we can uh, let us, we'll do a little bit of thinking and, and share some thoughts with owners and get back with you with uh, a little bit more direction on the agenda. But right now I think we're probably okay at the inverter level. Um, somebody's asking about the um, the material is from California. Yeah. Um, so we'll follow up one. Yeah, after. it's in the RFP actually. Um, but we'll follow which up. I have a copy somewhere here, but yeah. <laughs> we'll follow up on that to clarify. I just can't. Thanks for all the great questions. I think that's that's all that's coming through chat. Let me just make sure no one's on uh, got their hand raised. I see no virtual hands raised. All right. Well, I'm going to slowly talk for a couple more minutes in case any other questions come in. But I want to say a big thank you to Ted here, who is our expert in answering all these great questions and looking at the sites and helping <laughs> helping us uh, work through all these um, different options. And um, so thank you, Ted, and thank you, Hannah, again, for um, being our legal um, net metering financing tax expert. Um, we couldn't do this without you. And thanks to all of you for your interest. Um, one thing I do want to say um, is that you know, if you are interested in doing business in Southwest Virginia, generally, just even, you know, aside from this RFP, um, interested in helping us with our efforts to bring the solar economy here, the solar industry here, um, please join up with our solar work group. You can sign up on our website, um, get involved in the meetings. Um, we'd love to have um, all y'all participate and um, help us with our goals. Um, any other questions? All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great weekend. And um, oh, Ted just won bingo. Yay, Yay Ted. Bingo. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. Uh.